With a pandemic spiking, Houston's mayor pulls the plug on the Republican State Convention. Sylvester Turner calls it preserving public health, but were politics also in play? Across the country, parents and educators grapple with the president's demand to reopen schools. With the health of millions at stake, can it be done safely? And in the nation's highest court, landmark rulings on religious liberty and presidential power. Could America finally get a glimpse of the Trump tax returns? I'm Greg Grugan, and welcome to Watch Your Point, where our panelists call it like they see it. Let's greet them. First up, Charles Blaine, founder of the advocacy group Urban Reform. Next up, well-known businessman and columnist Bill King. In the three spot, writer, educator, and radio host Antonio Diaz. Batting cleanup today, Bob Price, associate editor of Breitbart, Texas. And finally, longtime super neighborhood leader, Tamaro Bell. Let's begin. Here in the Bayou City, Mayor Sylvester Turner brought to a predictable close a not-so-dramatic game of pandemic chicken. Backed by a phalanx of medical experts and civic groups, Houston's chief executive canceled a gathering of thousands of Republicans set to hold their state convention at the George R. Brown Convention Center. Houston is a hot spot right now in a global pandemic. And we cannot have thousands of people gathering inside of the Jar Jar Brown. Angry Republicans quickly accused the mayor of trampling on their constitutional rights. Councilmember Mike Knox went even further, claiming the mayor purposely exempted the GOP convention from restrictions two weeks ago, only to shut down the event when Republicans refused to cancel. You know, you, you create a problem. You solve the problem, you look like the hero. And you just, anytime people of Houston hear a politician say, oh, this is not political, it most absolutely is. The more they say it, the more political it is. Okay, panel, what's your point? Let's start with Tomorrow Bell. I don't believe that he did this deliberately. I believe the daily rise in the last two weeks prompted him to do this. And I thought it was something and I felt that Abbott should have done, that I think he should have done it, but since, George R. Brown is a city-owned facility, and you don't have a constitutional right to have an indoor facility. You can be outside, you can march. That's your constitutional right. But the George R. Brown is owned, is owned by the city. And because he saw the rises in cases, he wanted to do whatever he could to stop the spread as quickly as it is spreading. And I believe that he did the right thing. Okay, Bob Price, what's your take on this? Well, first, I don't think it helps Democrats politically at all to cancel the convention because that's just going to rile up the Republican base and they're going to go. But but that said, you know, there's a reason why we're doing this show via Zoom and not putting seven people on a stage in a studio. And it's because of the, the possibility of contagion going from person to person in a closed environment. So you're going to take 6,000 people who some, for some reason, believe that wearing a mask is an infringement on your liberty, who average age of 60 or above puts them in the high risk group and cram them into cloud, crowded spaces and, and uh, where they're going to be in close proximity to each other and indoors with no mask. What could possibly go wrong? So I, I think that the, having the convention via Zoom or some other method needs to happen. And, and to do this in person just it was not going to be a good event. Charles Blaine, I suspect you agree with Bob. Yeah, I do. I mean, and, and here's the thing, you're right. It, this was a game of political hot potato. I think a lot of the top brass in the party wanted this canceled, but I don't think they wanted to say that. And so it was kind of pushing back and forth and back and forth. But I said on this show before when we talked about this, is that I don't know how you can shut down the state, how you can close bars, how you can reduce the capacity at restaurants and put all these people out of work, but then say that a couple weeks later, we're going to cram 6,000 people inside of a convention center to go gallivanting around for politics. How is that fair? Um, what frustrates me is that I don't feel that I feel that the activists in this were the ones who were kind of the, the pawns. And, and, you know, if I can just read a comment really quick, one of the activists pointed out, she's like, I'm $799 out um, because of this. And so I'm very angry. I live off of Social Security and my husband's disabled and his medical bills are killing us. And this is all because they didn't cancel it in advance where she could have gotten some of that money back. So it's really frustrating to see the activists are the ones who are the pawns in this game. And it's been kind of kicked back and forth. So, you know, Dan Crenshaw said he was said he's happy it's canceled. He's the most popular Republican in the state. I think there's something to that. 
Okay, Tony Diaz, a big sigh of relief from many in Houston that the Republicans aren't, in fact, gathering in mass in downtown Houston. It makes sense. Their own sponsors were asking the Republican Party to cancel the convention. Medical professor, professionals were asking them to cancel. Their own members weren't going to go in person. They were going to do it on video. So it boggles my mind that the Republican Party didn't take control of its own destiny. Mayor Turner did him a favor because otherwise they would have had a big flop like President Trump had in Tulsa, where people used common sense not to get into a big room full of people breathing on each other. And he, all these empty seats, they would have made the Republican Party look bad and have egg on his face. Everything turns out they're smart to not sue. So if they keep, su if they try and sue, there's threats to sue, there's evidently some lawsuits. They will just keep reminding people that the Republican Party could not run its own convention right. Bill King, Mike Knox told me he didn't believe that 7,000 Republicans were coming, that it would be something like 3,000. But as you watch this unfold, what was going through your head? Well, I thought it was a bad idea for him to insist on having the convention. Uh, and for there's two groups that really affected. One is that three or 4,000 Republicans that wouldn't have been able to participate because they were worried about the health. You know, what about them? We're just leaving them all out. And then on top of that, there were literally hundreds of workers that would have had to have shown up at the convention center to take care of the needs of these people. And it wasn't fair to them either. Look, there's a certain hypocrisy in my mind between canceling the Republican convention, but letting the George Floyd uh, funeral and the protests go on and so forth. But nonetheless, I think Sylvester made the right decision here. Tony, I saw you shaking your head on that. You don't see uh, the hypocrisy there? There's no correlation in that the George Floyd march was outdoors. The funeral the wasn't. The, wasn't the, yeah, the funeral wasn't outdoors. The city outdoors. center was not using it. It wasn't a convention center by the city. And the last thing I'll say about it, too, is when I had an event, we used to do the Latino Book and Family Festival. When the folks from Hurricane Rita were displaced, they called us and said, hey, your book fair is canceled. And we said, you know what? It's for the greater good. It put our group in a tailspin. But we said, we're going to eat the loss because it's better for everyone's safety. So if you're going to lead, lead and don't be a hypocrite. OK, we're going to leave it right there. Still ahead, more on the convention cancellation as Republicans lambast the governor for failing to intervene. Welcome back. Amid the fallout of canceling the state GOP convention, a broadside of criticism aimed at our once popular governor from his Republican base. Maybe it was just timing, but Greg Abbott's failure to intervene in the cancellation was followed by censure resolutions aimed squarely at the governor from a half dozen local Republican Party organizations across the state. Panel, is the political ground beneath Governor Abbott crumbling because he appears to be caught in a coronavirus crossfire. I'm gonna start with you, Charles Blaine. Yeah, I think it's definitely an issue. And when we get to these bigger counties, Harris, Bear, uh, Tarrant, uh, Dallas, these bigger GOPs, we're gonna, if, if we see them pass resolution, I think that's when you'll start to see a massive groundswell. Um, but yeah, it's an issue. I mean, but the, the things that they're pointing to are the, con the $295 million contract, contact tracing contract and things like that and his unilateral use of power under the emergency orders. And so they should be asking for the legislature to get called back into a special session so, to restore power to that branch of government rather than censuring him. But it's their choice. Hey, Bob Price, bad year so far for the governor. What's your take? Well, the governor's in a no-win situation. You know, he, he, unfortunately, he can't just be a politician. He has to govern. He has to lead and he has to take, um, make decisions that are very difficult. But for those out there that are really criticizing the mask order, you know, let's put this on here. And my liberty is not infringed at this point. I can still speak. I can still carry out the First Amendment. I can still go wherever I want to go. I can still do whatever I want to do. And the mask isn't there to protect me from you. The mask is there to protect you, uh, the other person, from getting contaminated and getting sick. Surgeons don't wear masks in surgery to protect themselves from the patient. They do it to protect the patient. Let's get real about this thing and look at it from a common sense perspective and put your dang mask on and quit about it. Sorry. Tony, look, uh, I got to think from a political perspective, some Democrats are reveling in Abbott's trouble. 
Well, since I'm ever competitive, if Bob Price is going to take the high road, I got to take an even higher road <laughs> in that it's really easy to beat up on him right now. But he is caught in a space that I think is very complicated because, as Bob said, he's got to make day-to-day -day decisions that we've never confronted before. And on one hand, you see a lot of dust. On the other hand, you see people out of work. And I do have to throw in here, we're not getting a lot of leadership from the federal government, which is leaving it up to us. So I think we need to unite and use our heads instead of letting this create a civil war. If the Republicans are fighting each other, I'm just used to Democrats and Republicans fighting each other. Let's make Texas work, guys, okay? Tomorrow, take 30 seconds. Look, I believe that he know he made a mistake when he went out and did said cancel all mask orders. What he should have said was decriminalize any mask order and put the mask order in place, but just not made it criminalized a long time ago. But he didn't. So now he's trying to clean up and he has problems, but I believe that if he does what Bob says, govern and not just be political, he'll be all right. Got to leave it there. Still ahead, the nation's highest court rules the power of Donald Trump's presidency does not include keeping his controversial tax records confidential. Welcome back. By a surprising seven to two vote, the Supreme Court ruled that President Donald J. Trump cannot defy subpoenas for his tax records issued by prosecutors in New York. A clear message from the Chief Justice that executive power in this nation is not equivalent to the immunity from judicial proceedings enjoyed by monarchs. Others see the decision as a practical victory for the president because his tax records are highly unlikely to reach prosecutors and a grand jury before the November election. This specific case involves the president's alleged illegal payment of hush money to a pair of former mistresses. Panel, what's your point? I want to start with Bill King. I thought the Supreme Court made a good decision. It was a little bit of a split the baby. Uh, they held, upheld the principle, but basically gave him another uh, day to fight this in court down the road someplace. Uh, you know, there was an old saying under English common law that you can't sue the king. Well, you know, that's one of the reasons we got rid of kings. Okay, Tony, I guess you watched this decision with great interest. No, it's fantastic because we are in a democracy. I'm really impressed that the Supreme Court is not doing Trump's bidding right and left, which is what he proposed was his whole point. He said he was nominating Supreme Court justices who were right-leaning and Republican, and it was very, very scary at the time because the Supreme Court is supposed to be above it. It's fascinating because it's proven that it is above it. On the other hand, too, I do wish he would show us his taxes, but if you're not going to see it before the election, you just need to read the, his niece's new book. Her name is Marielle Trump. The book is Too Much and Never Enough, and she blasts him for stealing her family fortune through tax racket. If you can't read his version through the taxes, read that book, Corruption, Corruption, Corruption. Okay, eager to hear Bob Price's take. Well, you know, the Trump lawyers argued that the president had absolute immunity, and the, the court ruled that that's just not true, and, and that's a good thing. We've seen cases in the past where presidents have been subject to subpoenas and had to provide information. So, but in typical John Roberts fashion, he didn't order that the president has to turn over his returns. He kicked the, the can down the road and said, you know, the, the Trump lawyers can now come back and argue specific arguments against this specific subpoena and talk about why it takes too much time from the president away from his job, uh, the impact of it, and, and all those other arguments that can be now weighed and are probably much more effective arguments anyway. But the other thing that I thought was a little disturbing is that I think this ruling kind of sets up every district attorney in the United States now, whether they're Republican or Democrat, to become the the Johnny or, or Ronnie Earls of, of today and go after presidents and just bury them in litigation and, and prosecution, frivolous prosecution. Uh, we need to get that out of the out of the prospect. The president can't be tied down with hundreds of, of cases and investigations that aren't based on anything. They're just fishing expeditions. Okay, we go to the accounting expert next, tomorrow Bell. Uh, First off, kudos to the niece. She won't be invited to any family reunions no time soon. <laughs> but uh, kudos to her for writing her book. But the go off, I, I was impressed by Robert. I read his argument and how he went back, I think, to President Burr. I thought that was great. 
Clarence the Clown Thomas talking about the president don't have enough time when they showed he's been golfing, what he been doing stuff, and he on Twitter 24 seven. So mm -hmm. obviously he got time on his hand. So I'm glad, yes, I agree they split the baby, but this and this, but telling him you are not a king. This is not a dictatorship. Your name is T-R-U-M-P, not Putin. Thank you. All right, Charles Blaine. Did the Supremes draw a correct line here in your in your estimation? Uh, no, I think they did. I think what they held was that we're all created equal under the law and the president's not better than us. And so I appreciate that. But what's more important than seeing his tax returns, I think, is we should be looking at these elected officials who are gaining money while in office, like Nancy Pelosi, whose net worth increased 62 percent while she was in office. Or Patrick mm -hmm. Murphy, the Democratic congressman from Florida, whose net worth increased 1,449 percent in one year while in office. Or Mark Vesey, who represents the 33rd district in Texas, another Democrat whose net worth increased 994% while in office. So why don't we look at those folks and talk about that rather than talk about somebody's tax returns who's been in office for five years. Let's look at uh, what Trump made in five years. Okay, <laughs> okay we're gonna leave it right there. We're gonna leave it right there. Up next, it never seemed an issue of if but when. Trump buddy Roger Stone has his prison sentence commuted by the president. Welcome back. We were going to use this time to talk about other landmark Supreme Court decisions involving religious liberty and contraception. But then on Friday night, the president decided on sooner rather than later to commute the prison sentence of his crony, Roger Stone. Convicted of witness tampering, lying to Congress, and obstruction, Stone was, according to the president, a victim of the Russia hoax and prosecutorial misconduct. Panel, what do you think of this development? I'm going to start with Bob Price. Well, at first, I think it's interesting that he commuted the sentence and didn't issue a complete pardon. You know, we, we know for a fact that there was a lot of malfeasance going on in the Department of Justice in this whole Russia investigation and the, the frivolous prosecution of people and bringing them in and setting traps for, uh, for lying to, to the FBI. This was going on and it's been documented and it's going to be continued to be documented. There's more investigations going on. I remember when we first started talking about the Russia investigation and Tony and some other people were saying, you know, we need a full investigation. We need a full investigation. Well, now we've had the investigation into Trump. Now we're going to have an investigation into these people that were corrupt in the, inside the Justice Department and what's going on with them. Tony, got to let you respond to that. Let, let's get something straight. Roger Stone lied under oath. That is a high crime. And now you have one liar protecting another liar. That's really what it boils down to. A president abusing his power to let off the hook a snitch that backed him up. This is almost as appalling as when he pardoned racist Sheriff Joe Arpaio, who was a convicted racist, President Trump has shown us that we better elect people that have a conscience and ethics. Otherwise, they will abuse every single moment they have. And the fact that he did this before he gets voted out of office proves that Stone has some dirt on him. we got to stop this corruption. Only way we can do it, you can't count on a Republican Congress to keep him in check. we got to vote Trump out to end this corruption. Decay of America. Bill King, are you bothered by the fact that, uh, you know, friends uh, of the president uh, seem to be getting his favor when it comes to these pardons and commutations? Well, uh, politically motivated or connected uh, commutation and pardons are nothing new. They happen in every administration. You know, typically they happen after the election, just before the president leaves office. You know, that happened in the Obama administration. Um, I feel a little differently about this one. I was okay with the Flynn, uh, the dropping the charges on Flynn. I thought there was some deference to his military career was in, was, uh, was in order, and the fact that the charges were relatively uh, trivial. These charges against Stone are a lot more serious, and he doesn't have any background that, in my opinion, uh, justifies any deference that Flynn. So I think this is a mistake. I think it's going to hurt Trump in the fall. Okay, Charles Blaine, uh, your read on the president's actions. 
Uh, it's kind of absurd, you know. There are many people who are more deserving of having their sentences commuted than Roger Stone. But on the flip side, you know, I'm from New Jersey, and we have this this saying there, deny until you die. And as another Fox 26 contributor, Charles Adams, half-jokingly noted on Twitter that if I was president, you know, and one of my rider dies went down for me, I'd probably commute his sentence or come out in favor of him as well. So I can see why the president would do that for a friend and an ally. So, you know, while it's crazy, like Bill said, other presidents have done it, and it's nothing new. Tomorrow, real quickly, should it have mattered that the, uh, the defendant in this case, Roger Stone, was 67 years old and had uh, major health problems? Should it matter to who? Uh, there's plenty of 67-year-olds still in jail. I can assure you, some mm -hmm. in there for some minor drug offense they might have done as a kid. But the first time, I can't believe Barr even said something to the fact that he didn't think this should have went down like that. He must have not taken his medicines yet. Because he okay. don't never disagree with the president. <laughs> Got to leave it there. Coming up, with a pandemic still raging, a ferocious national debate is unfolding over reopening public schools in the fall. Will the president's plan put students, teachers, and their families at unacceptable risk? Welcome back. Come hell or high water, the president wants public schools fully open and operational for the fall semester. Furthermore, Mr. Trump called the CDC guidelines for reopening schools unworkable and threatening to uh, cut federal funds if students aren't welcome back. His motivation is pretty clear. The economy can't return to normal if millions of parents without child care can't return to work. On the flip side, reopening tens of thousands of schools without adequate protection could potentially prolong an already debilitating pandemic. Panel, what is your point? Let's start with a former classroom teacher, Tamara Bell. I believe that the, as, a, as a parent of children who went to public school, it is imperative that before you even ask somebody to put themselves in harm's way or put their child in harm's way, it has to be a clear cut, a clear cut plan that does not exist. It doesn't exist. I've listened to several teachers, one from Cypress ISD, one from HISD, tell me what the school's plan. If somebody tests break down with COVID in high school, then the school got to be shut down for two to three days. If they're in elementary, how are they going to do it? They need to have both ears open, one to the safety, one to the education, and they both need to come together because I do believe children need to be educated in a cohesive environment. I do believe that being around other children is what helps you develop and being in that, but it has to be done safely. Can't be just rushed back in because look at what we're doing now because we rushed opening back. You cannot put children and teachers, teachers, in harm's way like that, so callously and indifferent. Oh, if you don't do it, I'm gonna get federal money. He was so worried about manifold safety, he brought his ass out of jail. If it's safe for them to go back to school, it's safe for his ass to get back in that cell. Okay, Tony, you're still teaching classes at the college level. You know, what is your take on reopening fully in the fall? Well, evidently, Donald Trump is trying to run our education system like he ran Trump University without much thought. He needs to put more thought behind this, more funding behind this. Otherwise, he's playing COVID-19 roulette with our kids. And let's just focus on Texas. In Texas, there are over 5.2 million public school students, OK? The infrastructure is built to house that many students. That's what the space was built for, just social distancing. Maybe on a good day, students are two feet apart. Now you want them six feet apart? in an infrastructure built for 5 million students, so now it's supposed to accommodate three times that amount of space for 15 million students? That makes no sense. There's no money for that. Let's talk about the teachers. What's the training now? You go from, you're supposed to have, some teachers have 150 students in high school to 200 students, so then do you have one third? Where do the other two thirds go? And additionally, Where's all the money for all the supplies they have to keep doing? This is poorly thought out. They need to, they need to vote Trump out. He's going to ruin education like he ruined the country. Bob Price, take 30 seconds on this issue. Yeah, first off, this isn't Trump's decision. This is a state and local issue. So, Tony, you're just way off base on that. The, this is probably the most difficult decision that has to be made in terms of, of reopening this country is when do we bring the children back into the classroom? When do we expose children, not only the children, but the teachers, and not only them, but their families at home, their parents and their grandparents who are going to 
realize what comes from this. You know, we just shut down the convention because there were going to be four to 6,000 people in a closed environment, but we're going to cram millions of students into small classrooms. Let's look at this and figure out a way to get it done. The education is certainly one of the most important things that needs to happen, but safety needs to be in here as well. Jump in here, Bill King. Well, I think it's important to note that the American Pediatric Association this week recommended that kids be back in in in-class schools. You know, so everyone that's concerned about Corona, it's always let's follow the doctors and the scientists until they say something we don't like and then we're going to ignore them. Uh, So I do think there's some uh, there's a medical base for this. One of the frustrating things I have about this, and this is where I think the CDC has really let us down, is we really do not understand the mechanics behind the transmission of this virus. I mean, so far, a handful of children uh, have come down with the disease. We don't know whether they transmit it or not. It is ridiculous at this far into this, we haven't done the research to fully understand that dynamic, which would inform us about this decision. Okay, we're going to close with the panelist most recently in a public school classroom. That would be Charles Blaine. (laughs) Yes, as a former classroom student. um, You know, home isn't safe for everyone. And I'm not saying that was my case, so my mom's watching, I don't want to get in trouble. But for a lot of students, home is not safe for them. And school is the first place where, if it's physical abuse, the teacher sees that and can intervene. If it's it's a mental health issue, the support staff can see that and intervene. If If they're living in poverty and they don't have food, school provides that for them. If they don't have access to broadband, internet, computers, school provides that for them. So there are a lot of students who are going to go without the necessary services that come with school if we don't get them back in school. So I think that that's a huge part that's missing this conversation. It's definitely important to get them back in school for that reason. Okay, we're going to leave it there. Still ahead, panic among thousands of foreign students getting education in America. The president says if they can't go to an actual classroom, he's shipping them home. Harvard, Stanford, MIT, USC, Four well-known universities now suing the Trump administration over its new policy regarding foreign students. That is, if they attend a college that is not reopening for in-person instruction, those students must go home or face deportation. The universities didn't mince words, calling the move cruel, reckless, and shameful. Many have volunteered to accept the health risk and offer classes so they can remain panel What's this all about? Tony, I bet you're upset. This makes no sense. This is just another part of Donald Trump's random anti-immigrant rhetoric to feed his base. It makes no sense. And I want to remind people, too, that he's he's a hypocrite because he land blasts poor migrant families, but then he makes farm workers essential workers. These foreign students are essential students to our universities, our colleges, our public universities, because they pay double the tuition, and they also bring in other cultural influences. And they've made sacrifices. They survived the whole COVID-19 issues here. This would only hurt the whole system across it. He needs to get off his anti-immigrant bandwagon, and he's going to lose to the lawyers of Harvard and MIT and Stanford put together. Bob, I got to tell you, I I sense a dog whistle here. I mean, this isn't going to happen before the... uh... Uh, let it be litigated before the November election. No, I, I, I think the president's exactly right on this. You know, the biggest segment of the illegal alien population is visa overstays. A student visa does not give you the right to live in the United States. It gives you the right to come here and attend a university. If you're not attending a university or college, then you don't need to be here. If you're going to have virtual classrooms, you can virtual classroom from anywhere in the world. So they don't need to be here. This isn't an immigration. These aren't immigrants, by the way. These are visitors. Student visas are visitor visas. They're not immigration visas. What's your take tomorrow? Uh, Look, I I have a neighbor who's affected by this right now. And the universities know that what happened when COVID happened and they shut down the universities. And these people had already paid for health care that is required because they're foreign. They paid for different things for dental and all this. And all of that was shut down and they gave them no refunds. These people, I have a student who's about to graduate. He has laboratories that he must attend for the degree that he's obtaining. This has to be worked out because it is not fair for you to wait till somebody's a senior and then say, go home. You don't know the internet their capabilities, where they come from. You don't know if their country is able to even get through. I don't think it's right. I hope it is a dog whistle. And I hope that all of the universities sue him. Look, Charles Blaine, I mean, the sheer number of graduate students that come from other countries, uh, if they can't or pay their tuition, it will crush a lot of uh, universities and colleges. What's your take on this? 
You're exactly right. You know, Ken Cuccinelli with the DHS said that this is a tool to get schools to reopen. But the thing is, to your point, $44.7 billion is what foreign students contribute in tuition costs and other things for um, through their schooling. And so we're risking them that schools not taking the bait and reopening and forcing these kids back. And that's, you know, going to be missed opportunities to these schools. That's going to be um, them not contributing to our workforce when they graduate. And so I don't see the purpose of this. I think it's, it's a threat that, that might backfire on us. Bill King, your take, 30 seconds. Uh, I think it's a meaningless threat. I don't think under the law he can do this. Uh, and I don't know how you would possibly administer it. I mean, what if, like, Tamara says someone's not going to class, but they're attending laboratories? What if halfway through the semester they go back to in-person classes because the cases are down? It's just unworkable. I think, I agree with what Charles said, I think this was pressure to get the colleges to have in-class, uh, in-person. Got to leave it there. Got to leave it there. Still ahead. Did the president and his Defense Department suppress knowledge of Russian paid bounties on U.S. combat troops? That's our topic just ahead. Welcome back. Unconfirmed. That's how the White House describes intelligence reports that Russia has been paying the Taliban bounties for killing U.S. troops. The president says it's possibly another fabricated Russia hoax. That said, there is confirmed evidence that the Russians have been aggressively transferring arms and high-tech equipment to the Taliban, all while the U.S. has been sharing intelligence with Moscow on the president's order. Panel, what should America make of this development after all? It's well known we armed the Taliban against the Russians back in the 80s. Bob, what's your take? Well, once again, you've got the deep state operatives in the intelligence community joining forces with the left-wing media to bring the Russia hoax back out to the, the forefront. You know, the, the facts that we know are very little in this situation, and but there's much dissension between different aspects in the intelligence community as to the validity of these allegations of, of bounties. If there are bounties on American troops by Russia, then I think we need to take active sanctions against Russia. We need to punish them in every way possible. And one of the most quick ways we can do that is flood Northern Europe with American liquid natural gas and just put Russia out of business and bankrupt them. So there's a lot of things that the president can do. And the president has been very tough on Russia on a lot of issues. So this whole Russia favoritism thing is just a load of malarkey. Okay, Tony, a lot of smoke here. Do you think there's fire? Uh, dear Republicans, Ronald Reagan is rolling in his grave. To think there'd be a moment when Republicans are undermining the CIA and our intelligence agencies and saying that they're liars and the president who has a record of lying is telling the truth. Worse, he needs to really investigate this. I don't care about Hillary's emails. I don't care if Obama was born wherever Trump lied and said he was trying to be born. I care that there is doubt that our president was sticking up for America first and he was arming our enemies and giving them intelligence and worse, helping to reward killers of American soldiers. He needs to get to the bottom of this. And if, the, if Republicans let this go, they don't deserve to be in power at any level of government. So they need to wake up and put the country first and settle this now and settle this doubt. Bill King, are you troubled by these reports uh, of, of bounties uh, paid to the Taliban by Russians? Well, of course, it's an extremely serious allegation. And uh, I don't agree with Bob. I mean, there's something about um, Trump's fascination with Putin and Russia that doesn't make any sense to me. I think Congress really should investigate this very thoroughly and let us, the American people, know whether there's any uh, credence to this or not. If, he, if this was really ignored, it is the most serious thing he's done. But if it didn't happen, we need to know that as well. Okay, Charles, what's your take on this issue? Uh, yeah, it's interesting because reading through it, it says that the NSA didn't agree with the val validity of the information that the CIA had. And so there was this kind of like miscommunication of information. And it's eerily similar to, to kind of going back to 9-11, where it was the FBI and the CIA having this miscommunication of information and it fell through the cracks. And so I do think that there is some sort of problem there where that information is not being relayed to agency to agency. And that's probably why, if it's true, it did not end up on the president's desk. And so I think similarly to what we did in 2001 with trying to bridge that gap, we need to look at bridging that gap now to make sure that information is transmitted um, the way it should be. Okay. Coming up, it may be a first of its kind, a Texas congressional runoff with both candidates absolutely refusing to talk to reporters.
Welcome back. It may be a sign of the times, but it's the damnedest thing I've ever seen. Two Republican congressional candidates completely unwilling to entertain questions from local reporters. Instead, millionaire Kathleen Wall has carpet bombed airwaves and mailboxes with mostly negative ads aimed at opponent Troy Nels, who is relying almost entirely on the goodwill he gathered during years of service as a constable and later Fort Bend County Sheriff. Panel, how do you see this race playing out? Charles Blaine, I know you're watching it. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think we're seeing this trend in the Republican Party where Republicans don't like to talk to the media because they feel that the message is going to be distorted or contorted or whatever. And so they use a lot of access to or a lot of mail and stuff like that. Um, the president does it well. He directly connects them through social media and stuff, but these candidates aren't. I mean, the, the TV ads and the mail isn't working. Um, I think Troy's trying to maintain this, the credibility he has built as a sheriff among his base. And so he doesn't want to get out there and talk. And I guess Kathleen is doing the same thing with the folks that are supporting her. Um, I don't know. It's a weird race. And I just wish they would get out there and talk to people more rather than just hitting us with ads all the time. Uh, Bob Price, you watched that CD2 race that Wall was involved. She spent $6 million there and, and finished third. Looks like it was the same strategy here. Do you think it's working? Well, I think that's the strategy she, that she's trying to employ. But, you know, when you watch her performance in the CD2 race, it's pretty clear why she doesn't want to speak candidly in front of reporters or in front of crowds. So, um, you know, but that said... It, it's our job as voters to, to vet these people before we elect them to Congress. And right now, you can't have in-person debates. You can't have, apparently, we can't have interviews, in-person interviews or even Zoom interviews for some unknown reason. How are we supposed to actually vet these people? We can't rely on Kathleen Wall's uh, billions of dollars, that's an exaggeration, of, of campaign ads, or, or Troy Nell's just sitting on his his name recognition and popularity within the county. We need to ask them specific questions about their policies and what they're going to do and how they're going to respond to different things. And we can't do that right now. That is robbing the voters of their right to choose. Bill King, Kathleen Wall is going to spend about $7 million on this campaign, according to Mark Jones. Uh, what's your take? There's no adage in Texas politics, local politics. Don't mess with the sheriff. <laughs> and I'm just telling you, the odds are here that Troy's going to win the race. Uh, that My folks I'm talking to down there uh, think that the, the negative campaign have actually had a backlash against Wall at this point in time. And I think the fact that she clearly didn't live in the district, I guess she established a residency for running it. By the way, interesting, you know, you don't have to live in the congressional district that you're trying to represent. But I think the fact that she's coming from outside, she's running this, you know, terrible negative campaign against somebody who was pretty popular there. It seems to be backfiring to me. Tomorrow, 30 seconds. I know exactly why Kathleen Wall has not wanted to be on anybody's interview. Go look at YouTube. Go look at her <laughs> her, her, her impromptus when she was running from Congressional 2. Uh, red. <laughs> I mean, she is horrible, horrible. That's why she ought to be on TV. <laughs> OK, we're going to leave it there. Still ahead, more on the upcoming runoff elections and the astounding early turnout despite the coronavirus. Welcome back. In the teeth of a Texas summer under the cloud of a deadly pandemic, Texans turned out in record numbers to vote early in the July 14th runoff elections. Initial reports show Democrats substantially outpacing Republicans. Panel, this is all despite dire predictions that a Failure to expand vote by mail options would suppress turnout. What's your point? Let's go with Tony. Really proud of all the folks that have gone out to vote. And I want to remind folks that Ted Cruz only won by 200,000 votes against Beto. There's at least 114,000 new voters since that election, and there'll be more in November. So I, if I was a Republican, I'd be worried. I wouldn't run too far right. I wouldn't count on Trump. And I'm proud of all the people who went to vote. I took my sons and my mother-in-law to vote. We were very careful. We drove in one car, used hand sanitizers, used our glasses. And he had a funny little glove to vote with. So get out there, do your duty, and don't take any risks. Charles Blaine. Yeah, Tony, if you were a Republican, I'd be worried, too. I'm just kidding. Um, I voted on Friday, and of course the turnout is higher for Democrats because we don't have anything to vote for on our ballot. They've got a contested Senate election, which is interesting. Um, but it did not scare me. They had the separation there at the polling locations. It seems like it's safe. I think that we should continue to push forward with this voting in person and, and drop all this other nonsense that Democrats are pushing about online voting and email voting here in Harris County. Okay, 15 seconds, Bob. 
Yeah, so much for the argument that we're trying to suppress the vote. You know, clearly it's safe to come out and vote in person. I, I voted this week and, and it was very interesting. All the precautions that were taken to make sure that everything was safe, clean, and that you didn't actually have to touch anything. So it, it was really a, a very uh, safe process and I'm glad to see it. 15 seconds tomorrow. I, I think that I applaud the Democrats for coming out, especially I saw a bunch of young first time at the African-American polls, predominantly minority polls. So keep it up, people. Stay for the fight. Stay woke. You have even less, Bill King. Ten seconds. Runoffs for special elections. I wouldn't draw too many conclusions from them. Okay, we're going to leave it right there. The discussion continues on a national level with Fox News Sunday and host Chris Wallace. For all of us here, have a safe and healthy week.